Welcome back to another Excel VBA tutorial. Alrighty, in today's video, we are going to be covering our next object on the hierarchy, and that is query definitions. So let's get ready. OK, well, hopefully everyone is having a good day. Um, so we're talking Access VBA, obviously. In our previous video, we really served to introduce the topic of Access VBA and really just getting us comfortable with working with the object model. We didn't do anything super complicated. It was more focused on getting us comfortable writing the code, understanding the natural flow of objects in the hierarchy, and then doing some basic operations like grabbing the current database or even creating a table. So very basic things. So now that we've seen how to create a table, we're now going to move on to the next object, which is creating queries that we can run against the tables inside of our database. Now, like I said, Access VBA is a little bit different. So we are going to see that there's some challenges that come along with writing our code specifically for Access VBA. We're going to find that sometimes it's a little bit challenging to work with collections to check if something's there or not. But we will walk through how we can mitigate those issues. All right. So the first thing I need you to do is go to your Create tab on the ribbon. And you'll notice right over here on the right hand side, you have macros and code. You'll also notice that there is a visual basic icon. This is another way to access your visual basic editor. In the previous video, we went to database tools and then we went right here. But a second option is go to create and then visual basic. So you just click that. Uh, and then from here, we're going to insert a new modules and we're going to call this uh, what is it? Introduction to queries. I already have a module that's named that, so I'm going to add video to the end of mine. OK, then from here, we're going to now create a new subroutine inside of our particular module. So we're going to do sub work with queries. And then from here, like we've done in pretty much every other video, we're going to declare our variables. So very hopefully familiar steps at this point. The first variable is going to represent our access application. So we're going to uh, call it access app. This will represent an application object. Additionally, we will be working with the actual database we're currently in. So we will also declare a database object that refers to a database that lives inside of an access application. Just as a reminder, like pretty much every other Office application out there, you can have multiple uh, databases opened at the same time. OK, and then from here, we're going to do access query. So this one's a little bit confusing. So there's a queries collection and you'll notice there's query tables and all this kind of fun stuff. What we care about are query def. So that is short for query definition. Now, a query definition is not simply just a SQL statement. There are other properties and components to it. So because we are working in the world of BBA and pretty much like any other programming language, you can't just look at it as a simple SQL statement. There's more components to it. There is a time it was created. There is a database it belongs to. There's a connection that's a part of it. So this is all part of that query definition object. We'll see a little bit of that as we start working with the object. But I do want to make that clear. When you're creating a query definition, you're not just creating a query. You're not just creating a SQL statement. You're actually creating a lot of different things at once. And you'll be able to access those properties as you work through the code. Additionally, when you do make a query, usually you have something sent back to you, right? So when you do a select query, you have you know, data sent back to you. That is going to be in the form of a record set. So we're going to declare another object called a record set. A record set simply refers to records that were returned from your query. So you define a query, you run that query, it's going to return data back to you in the form of a record set. So that's just rows of data. Now, there's certain operations we can do with a record set. One of those is cloning a record set. So I'm going to declare another object variable which is also going to be a record set, but I'm going to store my cloned record set 
in that object variable. So it just is another way of demonstrating some operations. I also have a query definition name. This is just gonna be a string. I'm gonna be using the name of my query in multiple parts of my code. So I wanna store the name in a variable so I don't have to constantly change nine different places if I change my query name. Okay, first things first, let's grab the access application. So with this one, it's gonna be set access, access app. Actually, you know what I'm gonna do? Sorry for being OCD. I'm going to make these all uppercase. <laughs> I don't know why I did that, but I'm doing it like that. So this one is going to be the application object. Again, this refers to Microsoft Access. Inside of your Access database, you need to grab the current database. So you set the Access database object variable equal to your Access app. You'll notice there is a current DB method that returns the current database object that you are currently working out of. So that works for us. And then from here, I'm going to define my new query name. Now, there's a couple of things I want you to be aware of. Uh, when you try to create a new query, you can run your code once, it's probably gonna work fine. You run it twice and you already have that query there, guess what's gonna happen? You're gonna get an error. You're gonna get an error because you're trying to create a query that already exists. So at certain points, you're gonna see me jump back to my user interface to delete that query. That is simply because I need to rerun the code multiple times and I have to make sure that I don't keep encountering those errors. So just be aware of that as we go through the process. Okay, so from here, we're gonna do poll stock prices test. Now this is gonna pull some data from one of my stock price tables. There's nothing really fancy in it, just some, some interesting stuff. Now we're gonna also, <laughs> how do I wanna do this? You know what? We're gonna do it a little bit different. So I'm gonna write it with the intention to break it. So bear with me. <laughs> well, I'm about to write it in such a way where I know I'm gonna get an error, but I want us to see the error so that way we understand why we're doing the next step. So I'm going to create a new query definition. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set that access query object equal to my access database. Inside of my access database, I have a create query def method. This will create a new query definition that belongs to your access database. So this specific database, the one we're currently working out of. So your query definition has two components. One is a name. This is the name of that query definition. So I already defined it up above, so I'm just gonna pass through that variable. And then I have the SQL text. This is the actual SQL command that's gonna be run against your database. So in this situation, I'm gonna do a very simple query. I'm gonna say select all columns from the table called stock prices. So what does that table look like? Well, if you go here, it's a really basic table. It's just got some fake generated data I put in here. And you can see right here, it's only like 20 rows, so nothing super crazy. So all it's gonna do is it's gonna return this entire table back to us. Now, naturally, if you had a much larger table, you need to take that in consideration when you're uh, selecting your data. That could make the runtime longer. It could uh, do all sorts of different things. So just keep that in mind. In my specific example, I'm working with a very small data set, so I'm okay doing a select all columns and all rows. Okay, so now that you create a database, I'm gonna also throw you another curveball. <laughs> so remember in the previous video where we talked about tables, right? So every time we created a table, we had to append that table definition to the table definitions object, I'm sorry, collection. However, in this situation, we do not need to do that. So we do not need to add the query definition to the query definitions collection. It's a little bit different. I know it's tricky, you're going back and forth, but in this particular situation, you do not have to append to the query definitions collection. Now to just, again, give some refreshers. Remember, we created table definition and then we appended that table definition to the table definitions collection. Here, we don't do that. This one, we can just uh, basically refresh the collection. I just like running that just to make sure it's, you know, everything's up to date. And then I refresh the database window. So first I'm going to refresh 
the query defs collection. So again, I'm going to call my access database object, and then I'm going to do query defs, and there's a refresh window. I don't think this is really a necessary step, but I just like to do it out of peace of mind, knowing that everything ideally should be up to date after calling this but I really kind of question if it's necessary or not. Stack Overflow kind of gives some <laughs> conflicting answers to put it nicely. Okay, so then we're gonna refresh the main database window. This is to make sure we can actually see it from our user interface. If we don't run this, you're not gonna be able to see it, but then it's still technically there. So then if you were trying to run code and you can't see it or say the user couldn't see it, it's gonna start popping up errors saying it already exists but then the user's not seen it. So it's, they're probably gonna be a little bit confused. So you just gotta be aware of that. So this will refresh it and then show it in the uh, main window. So let's run it and see what we get. You can see right here that it did pop it out and looks like it did pretty well. It looks like it pulled the data, so that's awesome. Seems like it's working nicely, which I like seeing. So from here, um, oh, sorry, not that one, this one. <laughs> I did the one down here, put it up above. So again, still same output, so you don't have to worry about it. But now comes the fun part, because if I run this again, what do you think is going to happen? I'm going to get an error. I'm going to get this particular error. It's the runtime error 3012. And basically, it's telling us that the object we're trying to create already exists. So now we come into this kind of odd predicament. How do we grab an existing object from the collection if it doesn't already exist. Because there's kind of an issue. If we try to grab it and it doesn't exist in the collection, well, we get a different error. And that particular error is that it doesn't exist in the collection. You're trying to grab something that doesn't exist. So there's different ways to mitigate this. One is some people will say, uh, basically, you try to throw an error. So if you get an error, you just kind of skip it. And then if you have that error, you know it doesn't exist. Uh, I kind of have heard mixed reviews about that approach. Yes, it's a little bit quicker, but you have to be careful because then if there's potentially a different error, um, you're not going to be aware of it. And so people have kind of, again, give mixed reviews on it. So what I found to be probably not the fastest way, but I think a more kind of reliable way is we're going to define a function that checks if that particular name is in the collection. So down below, I'm going to create a new function and I'm going to call it is in collection. But I'm also going to write it in such a way where it's generic, where I could actually use it across different modules. I don't have to kind of restrict this one. Um, I actually can make it a little bit more generic if, and we'll talk about it in a second, but if that particular object had this attribute. So again, I create a new function. This is the name. It's going to have two arguments. One is going to be the object name. And one is going to be the collection to check. The object name is a string. And then the collection to check is going to be an object. So from here, I'm then going to declare some more variables. So declare variables for the function. And with this one, the first one is going to be collection object as object. This will be an individual object in our collection that we're looping through. And then we're going to also create another variable that will be a Boolean. And it's basically a flag that will set to true if we found the object in name uh, part of the collection. So if we find it, we just want to set a flag saying we found it. So what we're going to do is we're going to first loop through the collection. Again, nothing fancy. We've done this many of times in other videos. So hopefully nothing here is kind of concerning you or anything like that. And then we're going to do collection to check. So from here, it's going to be next. And then from here, if the name matches, it means we have a match. So what we're going to do is we're going to say if collection object dot name equals object name, then and if the only thing we want to do is we want to put that was found equal to true. Now, a couple things to keep in mind. I'm assuming that my object that I'm checking has a property called name. If it doesn't have a property that is not called name, 
what do you think is going to happen? It's not going to work because there's no property. So even though I'm trying to make this generic, it's not to say it's foolproof. It's not to say it's going to work with every single collection out there because my assumption is that that particular collection, each object inside of that collection has a property called name. If it doesn't have name, unfortunately, it's not going to work. But hopefully that's very infrequently. And at least with the collections, we're going to be working with an access it seems to be working in most situations. So I haven't run across an issue yet. But if you find one, please let me know. Be happy to hear about it. So then the final thing that we're going to do, if uh, if it was found, we are good. And basically all this is going to do is if was found equals true, or sorry, does not equal to true, uh, then and if then we're gonna say was found equals false. The reason I'm doing this at the end is if I keep looping through it, then I would technically be reassigning this on each loop. So really what I want to have, have happen is um, when I find it here and then set it to true, I think there's even a better way to do it. I think you can do like an exit four. So there might be even some opportunity here to optimize a little bit more. So that could also be another option as well. And then uh, return, return, I don't even know how to say that, return the flag. So again, it's just we want to make sure that if we didn't find it, that the flag is set equal to false. Because what we're going to do up above is now that we have this particular function, I'm going to wrap this section right here. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of take a step back and I'm going to say, OK, this is fine. So I'm going to say if is in collection, and then I'm going to do object name. That's going to equal the query def name, the one that we defined up above. And then I'm going to do the uh, the collection to check. This one, again, is going to be the queries definition collection. So this one is going to be our access database. And then there's going to be a queries def. So if this and then you know you, you could even do something like this so if it equals false then do something if it doesn't then do something else so if it doesn't exist that means we need to create that query definition however if it does exist guess what we can just grab it from our collection and we'll be good to go so i'm actually going to copy this line up here because it gives us pretty much everything we need and then I'm just going to change a couple things about it. So I'm going to do this. Instead of doing create queries def, I'm going to do a create, I'm going to do the query defs collection. Yes, I see it. Perfect. So if it doesn't exist, then create it. Otherwise, grab it from the collection. Again, Hopefully this all looks relatively intuitive, at least the logic aspect behind it. So ideally, if I run it now, I'm not getting the issue because now it's just simply grabbing the actual, you know, query that exists. So now if I do debug print, I should see something here, ideally. And we can see, looks like it's working great. So I'm happy, um, looks like that part is working. So what are some things that you can do with a query definition once you have it? Well, like I said before, a query definition is not simply just a SQL command like this. There's multiple properties that belong to it. So for example, you could, if you wanted, you could say, hey, I could grab the name like I just showed you. I could show you, hey, what's when was it last updated? Maybe I want to know that. Or in some cases, maybe I want to do something like get the actual SQL command because you know, let's assume for a second that maybe you're going through somebody else's database. So you don't own this database, but you need to grab a bunch of information from that database because maybe you need to transfer it over to yours. Well, by being able to grab certain properties about your query definition, that will make that process a little bit easier. So while we know what our query definition is going to look like, we can't always assume we're going to have that information up front. In some cases, we might not have that information and we need to grab it from somebody else's database. So these properties will help us and allow us to do that. So for example, I can uh, see everything that I just did here. So I can see that was created today, just a few minutes ago. 
I can also see the actual SQL command behind it. And one of the cool things about it is I can also change the SQL command after I created it. So it's not static and you can actually change it as time goes on. You know, you can be a little bit creative, I guess, if you wanted to. So I'm just going to put a note here, print some properties about my query. Nothing super fancy, but you can tell. So let's uh, let's change it. So we uh, let's change let's change the raw query. So I'm going to do access query. I'm going to do that SQL property again. And basically, I'm just going to take this one. I'm just going to add another condition to the end of it. And all that condition is going to do is it's just going to sort my data for me. So nothing again, hopefully too complicated. And we're just going to say, hey, in this situation, uh, let's order by the date column uh, descending, something like that. So what happens if we do this? Well, let's go back and see what happens. So then I'll go here and it looks like it's good. It looks like it's now sort of descending. So that's pretty good. So now our newest is on the top and then our oldest is on the bottom. So now we were able to modify our query and have that, those changes reflected immediately inside of our database. So that's one thing you could do with it is you could modify the query after the fact. Um, you can also ask more questions about it. So you could ask, for example, you know, is you know, the access query updatable. I think this returns something. If not, I apologize. <laughs> okay, so it does. So it's just telling you that you can update it. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head if that's read write. So if you could change that, then what you could do is you could say, hey, once you create it, if you set updatable to false, then guess what? You can't change it. It's it's you don't have that authority anymore. Okay, additionally, like I said, most time when you're using a query, it's to go and fetch data from a particular table. And so in those situations, you're gonna have data sent back to you in the form of a record set. So basically multiple records that you would then probably iterate over or maybe grab some additional information. Lots of things you can do with it. So once we've defined our query, we will run it to get some records. So I'm going to set my access record object equal to my access query object. And then I'm going to have an open record set method. This will open a new record set, which is basically running that query and then returning that data back to you. So then from here, I can then grab some information about my record set because the record set is actually its own object that has its own methods and properties. So print out the number of records. So I'm gonna say debug print. There are, and here we go again, me spelling is always a <laughs> fun time. <laughs> I hate spelling with a burning passion. I hate a lot of things, but <laughs> spelling and writing is one of those things. I'm like, I hate doing it. <laughs> okay, so this will turn the number of records. So you can see here, there are 25 records in that particular query. So it makes sense. That's just all the rows in the table. OK, uh, then from here, let's loop through this record set. Now that we have it, maybe we want to print a particular field or, or something like that. So we'll uh, start uh, working with the record set object. So we'll say with access record and with. And from here, now we're going to start looping through. Now, this is a common notation that you're going to see, especially if you go on Stack Overflow and a lot of other tutorial resources. This is normally how you would loop through a record set. So uh, the note that I always tell to myself is as long as there's a record, keep going. So as long as we have records, keep going. Well, how do we kind of represent that as a loop? We'll say do until. And then there's this property that says end of field. So keep going until you've reached the end of the record set. And then keep looping, basically. So do until the end of the record set. And basically, it's just a loop. Once you're doing that, it's then pretty straightforward. You can just print out some of the data. Uh, if you want to print out a particular uh, column, for example, you would do exclamation mark. And then in brackets, you would just do the uh, column name. So in this case, if I wanted to do the date, I could print out the date. And then if I wanted to, I could also print out maybe like the closing price. 
But here's the really, 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 really important part of this entire code. If you skip this line, you are going to have an infinite loop. You must, you must, must, must have move next. What that is saying is go to the next record. If you do not call this method, guess what happens? It's just going to keep printing out the first record. You can see the problem with that. It's never going to end. So I'm gonna put this in very large font, very important. If you miss this line, it will run forever. This goes to the next record. You must add that. Oh, I know. Don't you love when I give you bad news like that? So let's see what this looks like. Looks good. So it looks like it printed out each date. And then on top of that, we also got each of the prices from the close column. So just a couple more lines of code just to kind of demonstrate, you know, just a few things we can do with a record. Nothing super fancy. Um, one thing we can do with a record is we can clone a record set. So sometimes we want to make copies of it. In that situation, we would just do uh, the clone method. I'll show you how to do that, but I'm going to first create or not create. I'm going to set my access record clone object variable equal to my old access record. And then I'm going to do clone. This will clone that particular record set. So then I can close it, do whatever I want with the old one, but this new one will still be fine. So. Sometimes you might want to do different operations with the same record set. This way you're able to kind of have multiple copies of the same record set, but you're not having to change everything about that one specific one. You can just keep it isolated when you make that change. So I'm going to say clone uh, record count is, and then this, uh, then revert to string, and then we'll do access record clone and then record count, I would expect to have the same. So that looks good as well. And then finally, one thing that you should, you know, normally get in a good habit of doing, it's not gonna break anything if you don't, but a lot of people kind of swear by it. I have mixed reviews about it. Uh, you would just close out your record when you're done with it. So you would just call the close method. That just means it's gonna close out and release it from memory, so. Most time this doesn't cause an issue, but sometimes if you run your code an awful lot and run right after the other, then I would highly recommend this because sometimes things get left open by accident. It's nothing you did wrong. It's just the system never technically ever got rid of it from memory. So this way you're ensuring that that step's at least done. So it should help mitigate that risk if it does happen in the future. And with that, guess what? We reached the end of our video. Oh, goodness. I don't want to go to that one. I want to go to this one. So if you have any questions about query definitions inside of Access VBA, feel free to put them down in the comments below and I'll do my best to help guide you through the process. In our next video, we're now going to go to what I would say is our first relatively complex example, which is we're gonna show you how to load data from Excel, more specifically an Excel table list object to be more specific, and how we're gonna load that data into an Access database while having both applications open at the same time, doing everything from creating the table and then making sure that those that table has the correct data types and stuff like that. So should be really helpful. I could definitely see where this might be uh, helpful for those of you who might have a simple access database to store your data just because, you know, maybe in your situation, you just you don't need an enterprise database, which is probably plenty of us um, to store all of your data. So. Uh, definitely keep an eye out for that video as well. And then also, if you are new to the channel, do a couple things. Uh, first, follow me on Facebook because that's where I'm going to be posting the code for this particular series. I do have it on GitHub, but if you want the actual access database, I have a group that is part of my Facebook page. So just make sure to follow that and then I'll put a post out there uh, when we when I post this video. So that's where I put like the actual documents itself. I am looking into other avenues right now, but for right now it's just going to be <laughs> Facebook. And then also, if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. If you have recommendations for new content, feel free to put that down below as well. Um, I'm always open to hearing what ideas you guys would like to see covered. I have a list growing, but you know, it's going by little by little. But other than that, you know, thank you again for watching and hopefully we'll see you in the next video.